Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the first event of this year's Wednesdays at the Center series, hosted by the John Hope Franklin Center and the Duke University Center for International and Global Studies. Today's lecture is co-organized by the Duke Islamic Studies Center and is titled 99 Clay Vessels, the Muslim Women's Storytelling Project. Today, we are pleased to welcome Alison Kaisia, a visual artist and a grassroots educator, and also the creator of the 99 Clay Vessels Project. We are also welcoming Ellen McLarney, an associate professor of Asian and Middle Eastern Studies at Duke and the director of the Duke University Middle East Studies Center. Professor McLarney will moderate the conversation with Alison Kaisia and the following question and answers. Please remember to keep your microphone muted and to submit questions and comments in the chat. Please let us welcome Professor McLarney. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Wednesdays at the Center. We're so happy and honored to welcome Alison Kaisia, who has come. Um, she's going to also come for a visit uh, to Duke in person tomorrow in our Middle East, in our uh, geo geopolitics and culture focus cluster, as well as hold a pottery workshop on Friday. Alison Kaisia is a multimedia artist whose work centers on Muslims, Islam, and Islamophobia. As a resident artist at Red Dirt Studio in Mount Rainier, Maryland, she is creating a series of artworks about the impacts of the 9-11 era on Muslims and other targeted communities. Previously, Allison was the director of the Challenge Islamophobia Project at Teaching for Change, where she wrote lesson plans, and taught them in teacher professional development workshops throughout the country. She has written curricula and facilitated workshops for the Muslim Anti-Racism Collaborative, Zin Educational Project, Amnesty International, Unity Production Films, Qatar Foundation International, and the Institute for Middle East Studies at George Washington University. Welcome to Alison Kaisia. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you for the invitation to share with you a socially engaged art project I'm working on called 99 Clay Vessels, the Muslim Women's Storytelling Project. It's an honor to speak at a center named after an educator and writer who did so much to educate me through the books he wrote about a history kept largely hidden from me for the first 18 years of my life until a series of college professors assigned texts like John Hope Franklin's books. So thank you to all of the educators who are here, um, who offer this gift of insight to their students. And thank you so much to Ellen and Julie for all of the many ways that you have supported this project. Uh, I really look forward to coming to campus tomorrow and seeing you all in person. So uh, I'm gonna tell you a little bit more about my career and who I am and how these 99 vessels came to be. Uh, I have been an educator since I was in college. Throughout my career, I have experimented with uh, different subject matters that I've taught and different pedagogies, always with a commitment to education as a tool of consciousness raising, grassroots empowerment, liberation, and a practice of freedom, in the words of Bell Hooks from her book, Teaching to Transgress, which was one of many books in college that really connected me to my passion. I earned a BA in race, class, and gender studies from Penn State University and an MA in history from George Mason University, located where I live in Fairfax, Virginia. I taught the history of social justice movements in a residential facility for severely abused girls. I taught English as a foreign language to immigrant adults. I taught US world and Islamic history in a community college. And over time through those experiences, I became increasingly committed to teaching about Muslims and Islamophobia. Uh, I also taught in interreligious dialogue courses. Uh, and th this, uh, this experience, these experiences teaching in interreligious dialogue courses 
uh, you know, was deeply disappointing because of the colonial attitudes and behaviors that are endemic in those spaces, as well as, frankly, a really rank bigotry that also lives in those spaces. Uh, I was working in an interfaith setting, which is where I created the 99 clay vessels, which I'll talk more about soon. And yet working in these interfaith settings got me really clear about how ineffective so many of the teaching strategies that we use to talk about Islamophobia are. Um, <clears throat> you know, interfaith settings in my experience are full of Muslims who are trying to explain Islam in order to reduce Islamophobia. But religious ignorance is not the root of Islamophobia. Racism is the root of Islamophobia. And when I say that, I mean an ideology that justifies the stealing of land, resources, and labor, in this case, at the hands of the US military. All of these teaching experiences shaped my thinking about how to liberate people from their biases about Muslims, which fed into me creating the Challenge Islamophobia Project at Teaching for Change. So this was my first, uh, you know, so I was out in the community, I was teaching about Muslims and Islamophobia and decided that I wanted to try something, you know, more systematic. And so I created this project, the Challenge Islamophobia Project at Teaching for Change. Teaching for Change is a nonprofit organization in Washington, DC. It is a sister organization to Zen Education Project and Rethinking Schools. And uh, these three organizations, I think have some of the most critical uh, some of the best critical thinking curriculum that you can find in the United States today. Uh, their work is deeply thought provoking for students and educators alike. So if you are not familiar with their work, I would uh, definitely check them out. So I created the Challenge Islamophobia Project where I wrote a series of lesson plans on Islamophobia and taught them in teacher professional development workshops throughout the country. And um, so I did this sort of curricular experiment. And as I said before, curriculum is something that I've experimented with uh, throughout my life. It's really like one of my art practices actually. And so I really took stock of what worked and what didn't work in the Challenge Islamophobia Project and other educational interventions that I've used. I also just started getting bored with the curriculum that I was creating and teaching. And I think there are many educators uh, on this call right now who understand, you know, uh, perfectly what I mean when I say that. Uh, there was this kind of like repetitiveness that I started to grow bored of and I needed to breathe some new life into my own teaching uh, and pedagogy practices. And of course, teaching about Islamophobia and racism broadly can make you extremely jaded. Uh, there is so much resistance to even having a conversation about this topic. You know, um, I'd love to say that so many of my experiences, I was walking into a room of people who were really excited to hear about what I had to say. But in fact, um, you know, these biases are so deeply entrenched uh, that um, uh, that it's hard to really keep my own energy level up to keep walking into these conversations. Um, and also really realized that in so much of my teaching, I was really kind of Clab, you know, clobbering people over the head with facts and figures and thinking that if I just hit them with more data, that somehow this message was going to get through. And yet, you know, we just know from education research that that's not the, the way things work. You know, we all hold deeply held beliefs that shape our reactions to the information that we consume. And so part of me was thinking about how to preserve my own heart while doing this work. And another part of me was wondering how to crack open people's hearts in a way that releases them from their biased thinking. Uh, and I wanted to, of course, challenge myself as an artist. Uh, I had practiced ceramics for over a decade, but I didn't consider myself an artist because, you know, I have noise in my head about what it means to be an artist. And so in order to kind of get over that, I joined an art collective. Uh, at the beginning of the pandemic, uh, Red Dirt Studio in Mount Rainier, Maryland, a just amazing place uh, that's an incubator for multimedia artists, all different uh, material practices. We all just really help one another with our, our artwork and help move our art life forward. Um, and it is there at Red Dirt Studio where I am creating a series of artwork about the impacts of the 9-11 era on Muslims and other targeted communities and the 99 Clay Vessels Project is one of them. 
in the work I'm creating at Red Dirt, I'm thinking about how to continue my commitment to anti-bias, consciousness raising education, while pushing myself to rethink the tools and objects I use to inspire those conversations. So I wanna share with you now uh, some pictures of the 99 clay vessels that I made. Um, I'm gonna share my screen and I'm just gonna move through the uh, images without speaking um, because I think that my voice is a distraction. I wanna just let you kind of absorb what I created and then I'll talk more about you know, what it all means. Um, so let me just juggle my screen here. Okay. Okay, so that gives you uh, some visual information about what I created. Um, how did the 99 clay vessels come into being? So as I said, I was working at this interfaith uh, education institution. And um, you know, I was hired to actually teach about Muslims, uh, Islam and Islamophobia, and yet it was a deeply bigoted uh, place. Uh, lots of enduring stereotypes uh, in the institution. And so after this prolonged experience of anti-Muslim bigotry, I was there for about a year and a half. Uh, and it was uh, really just through, you know, sort of coming home from work every day, being really um, disempowered by the conversations that took place there and uh, asking God, you know, what I was supposed to do with this and not wanting to just kind of walk away and drop it, but actually transform the power dynamics that were really driving that episode of bigotry. And I literally would come home from work and just, uh, I picked up, you know, clay. Clay has long been my therapy. And I just started making these sculptural pots. They literally kind of started coming out of me. And it became this nightly vicar that I did. Vicar meaning, uh, you know, ritual of remembrance. Um, where I, I, I just started meditating on the 99 names and thinking about like where my power is and that so much of my power comes from my faith. And that, that uh, this, you know, the 99 clay vessels, the 99 comes from the 99 names of God, Asma al Husna, um, and thinking about how, you know, the oneness of God can only be expressed through these 99 different characteristics. Um, and I really love that, um, you know, I love that connection, that the diversity of all is encapsulated in the one. So, um, so I made these pots. Uh, I fired them in a way to capture the fire marks on the clay, which was really important to me. I experimented with a number of different firing methods, but I really wanted to show the fire marks on the clay to symbolize uh, this idea of transformation, because as I said, I didn't want to just like quit the job and get a new job. I really wanted to transform out of this experience. And um, 
So I fired the pots. They turned out, I think, really beautiful. Uh, and then they were just kind of sitting on a shelf um, and I didn't know what to do with them. And then the pandemic hit and, um, you know, I was sitting, the, the pots were sitting in this cabinet in my dining room. And as I was working one day at my dining room table, the pots literally started to talk to me and said, um, you know, we're not supposed to just be sitting on this shelf, do something with us. And so, you know, asked them like, well, what am I supposed to do with you? And they said, you know, we held you during this really difficult time in your life. And so what if we held the stories of other Muslim women who like you went through this really difficult experience of bigotry, but you actually use those experiences to fuel your love and commitment to justice. And uh, so I was kind of ruminating on that. And so I went to my very good friend, Homera Ziad, one of my closest friends, and she is also the director of the program in Islamic studies at Johns Hopkins University. And she's often sort of like the go-to person that I say, hey, I have this uh, idea. What do you think? And she loved it. Um, she really loved the idea. And she immediately uh, said that she was thinking about um, Islamic poetry and that all of the Islamic poetry, both pre-modern and contemporary poetry that she has read, that these themes of clay, fire, and water as metaphors of spiritual transformation you know, are very popular in Islamic poetry. And so she immediately said, uh, I want to curate this collection of poetry to go with the pots. And, um, and she is doing that. And you can see a couple samples of those poems that she's curating on the 99claybessels.com website. Um, uh, Homera's program at Johns Hopkins is also the fiscal sponsor of this project. And her work on that front, including fundraising, has been really critical to the success of the project. So I just want to acknowledge her partnership. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about our intellectual partnership at the end uh, when I discuss where my art life is going from here. Uh, so after hearing more ideas about the 99 Clay Vessels Project, Homera suggested we reach out to another woman in the community, Sabrina Njai, who is a Muslim psychotherapist and healer based in Baltimore. She has worked with traumatized communities all over the world. She is a deeply healing presence. And so she suggested that we offer these small group workshops for women to do some storytelling uh, and to share their stories with one another. Um, and I'll come back to the storytelling workshop. We have one other collaborator on this project whose name is Sasa Akel. She is an undergraduate student in fine arts at Montgomery College in Maryland. She is the Montgomery County Youth Poet Laureate who's also a contributing author to the book, I Am the Night Sky and Other Reflections of Muslim American Youth, which was published by a press here in Washington, Shout Mouse Press, that amplifies the voices of uh, youth activists. And Sasa for this project is creating an art video of her interpretation of a recitation of the 99 Names of God. So the storytelling workshops, uh, we are inviting 99 Muslim women to participate in groups of 11 to share stories in an inclusive and non-judgmental space, and then ask them to create something to symbolize their story, like I did with my pots. As, Muslim, as Muslims and women, many of us have been through traumatic experiences that we have not had the time or community space to reflect upon and process. The storytelling workshops offer an opportunity to reflect on these experiences out loud in a community of compassion. You know, the other thing that happens is like we often go through these bigoted experiences and then we just hold it in. And we know that this literally creates toxicity in our body. And so something happens to us physically when we let those stories out in a community of people who are not being judgmental, but are really there to kind of hold our uh, story and to. Um, you know, acknowledge what we've been through. So we work together to create new possibilities out of these experiences. In the sharing and releasing of these memories and community, we fuel the creation of a new story, a definitive act of taking ownership over our own experiences and our representation. Ultimately, the storytelling workshop in this project is a celebration of Muslim women's diverse self-expression, experiences, identity, and power. The women, uh, this is an invitation only project. The women that we are inviting to the project all identify as social justice activists and advocates 
in different disciplines, connecting the personal and political struggle for justice. Importantly, also, not all of these stories are outward facing, but also include stories of intra-Muslim discrimination based on gender, sexuality, ethnicity, race, and class, discrimination which is intensified or reinforced in the context of Islamophobia. We make space in this project for women to share any experiences of bigotry, including bigotry perpetrated by other Muslims, to honor the reality that experiences of bigotry are not discreet and cannot be easily demarcated and categorized. Capturing complex and intersectional stories allows for greater breadth and depth of understanding of Muslim women's experiences. The participant list has evolved organically from personal contacts who then suggest friends and colleagues, and it just keeps growing from there. We're also working in collaboration with a number of Muslim women-led nonprofits to offer workshops tailored to the communities that they serve. Um, so one of the many sort of, you know, narrative goals of this project, I think that when we say like Muslim women, people don't immediately think, you know, social justice activists. And yet um, it is actually what I think, because so many of my friends are activists, they're artists. Um, and so that's something that I, I really wanted to amplify. And again, you know, that representation that it, there are so many Muslim women who are working to transform our society for the betterment of everyone you know, to create a, um, you know, radically inclusive democracy. Why women? Um, so, you know, all forms of bias and discrimination are gendered, and that includes Islamophobia, anti-Muslim bigotry, and intra-Muslim bigotry. While there have been far more diverse representations of Muslim women in the last decade, there's still a lot of work to do to repair the damage of centuries of negative portrayals, miseducation, and pernicious stereotypes. Gendered biases and discrimination take many different forms. Muslim women, especially those who are visibly Muslim in their clothing choices, face discrimination in schools, workplaces, and other institutions. They are easy targets for suspicion, exclusion, harassment, and hate crimes, and used as political pawns for US military uh, intervention. Muslim women are represented as needing to be saved from Islam and Muslim men. Muslim women's headscarves are represented as symbols of sexual control and sexual repression. Uh, LGBTQ Muslims are often made invisible by stereotypes of Muslim men as hyper-masculine, violent oppressors, and Muslim women as lacking sexual agency. Muslim women are represented as binaries, the so-called good versus bad Muslim women, both inside and outside Muslim communities with the goal of pitting us against one another. The voices of first and second generation Muslims are often overvalued as speakers and authorities for Muslim communities informed by and contributing to anti-blackness. So there's all of these sort of like, you know, politics uh, around our identity. And, you know, we're really concerned with like, how do we unload some of that so that women feel, you know, safe enough and free enough to share their stories? Um, we, the 99 Clay Vessels Project makes space for Muslim women to unload some of these burdens of identity and representation to tell whatever story they need to tell, whether it be outward facing, inward facing, or both in a community of compassion and acceptance. By removing these expectations about the emotional labor of Muslim women to take care of other people's feelings about who we ought to be, we choose instead to create an inclusive vessel to hold the complex experiences of Muslim women activists and creatives who work daily to heal and transform the world. Far from needing to be saved, these women are working on the front lines of creating a society that values rights, inclusion, solidarity, and equity for all. Capturing complex and intersectional stories allows for uh, you know, greater understanding of complexity of Muslim women's lives. And then from the workshop experience, so women meet in this workshop, they do a lot of like deep conversation work. And then what comes out of that is the creation of a digital story of her choice. And uh, she has complete freedom over what she creates. Uh, and we give her lots of ideas about what to create, but we have people who are, you know, just writing straight up narratives, like this is what happened to me. Uh, we have women writing a lot of poetry 
uh, some letter writing to who they were in the past, who they are going to be in the future. Some people are writing letters to uh, the person that victimized them. One woman wrote a song and sang it. Uh, other women are painting pictures uh, and like creating multimedia videos and audio clips. It's really amazing to see uh, what they come up with. Um, and there are some samples online, again, at the 99claybessels.com website. You can see a couple of those stories. Why now? Um, okay, yes, why now? So um, as we mark the 20, uh, 20 years since 9-11, this project adds to a historical record that has been shaped by the systematic exclusion of our perspectives in yearly commemorations and multi-million dollar memorials about that event. 20 years later, we remain committed to truth telling about all of the impacts of 9-11 era on multiple communities, impacts that reach far beyond what happened on that day. While 9-11 does not resonate with every single Muslim in the United States because we are diverse, and even though Islamophobia and anti-Muslim bigotry is centuries old, it is an era in which we saw a dramatic intensification of the criminalization and dehumanization of Muslims in the US and globally, fueled by US imperialism. In solidarity with many other truth-telling projects about the 9-11 era, the 99 Clay Vessels Project um, archives the stories of Muslim women who defy broad generalizations about us, amplifying the work that Muslim women social justice activists and creatives are doing in the world and their role in transforming and healing the world. So all of this information, so we're gonna have all of these stories on the website. We're gonna have the poetry collection. We're gonna have the recitation video. So this is all gonna be become sort of an online um, you know, art exhibition. And then we can also use the component parts of this in programming. So for example, you know, I'm here today coming down to uh, Duke tomorrow to do two in-person programs, you know, where I'll show the pots, we'll share some stories. Uh, one of the women who participated in the storytelling workshop that um, the Islamic Studies program at Duke sponsored, uh, she will also be there to talk about her experience in the workshop and to share her story. Um, and that part of the project is still sort of evolving. Like once we have all these component parts, then we're really looking for different ways to kind of take this out into the world uh, and to share this with different audiences. So just thinking a little bit about how this fits into a larger body of artwork that I'm currently creating. As I said, uh, I'm at Red Dirt Studio. Uh, creating a series of artwork about the impacts on Muslim communities in the 9-11 era. Um, and, uh, you know, this is also, the storytelling workshop in particular is also part of another, um, you know, investigation that I'm doing just about how in Muslim communities we create spaces that really like resonate with our spiritual life. And uh, the storytelling workshop in particular has just been an incredible like space of creativity in that way. Just hearing the feedback of the women that have gone through it so far and talking about how we don't have enough of these spaces and that the time that they spent in the workshop and really working on the creation of their story has been so deeply fulfilling to them. And so that has me really excited to also just think about you know, how we create these sort of like God conscious spaces, um, you know, in our community broadly, uh, you know, rethinking spaces of worship and really trying to also connect the academic study of religion to lived experiences of religion in ways that are life-giving and empowering and increase God consciousness. Uh, as I said, you know, this collaboration between Homera and I in particular, you know, that's a conversation that the two of us have been having now for over five years. Um, 
you know, her being a scholar of religion and me, you know, being sort of a community grassroots educator and, uh, you know, um, adherent, you know, and trying to think about how we make connections there to, you know, create spaces that are that are really enriching. Um, also kind of dealing with my own ongoing trauma of male dominance and authoritarianism in religious spaces and all of those power dynamics, um, you know, also coupled with the loss of, uh, of interest and boredom that comes with a certain level of mastery in our spiritual life. For some time, I felt like I had to stop being Muslim because I couldn't find what I was looking for in terms of an empowering space of worship. But then I realized that I was giving up my own power by allowing myself to think that someone else had to give this to me. And, um, you know, I realized that I had to create this space uh, and invite others to it. You know, that I am in fact a creator who can create these spaces for myself and others. And so, um, you know, I'm really interested to kind of see where 99 Clay Vessels goes uh, and how it develops. And just to think about how I can keep that momentum up you know, creatively to create more spaces where, um, where we can uh, express our love of God, our love of our faith, um, despite the many forces degrading our ability to keep our hearts, minds, and souls intact so that we can really fulfill our purpose uh, in life, which for me is really about freedom and liberation for myself and others. And I think on that, I'm going to pause and uh, see what kind of questions we have. I haven't been looking at the chat. Um, have I gotten any criticism from Muslims or non-Muslims about the project? <laughs> I, got, I, I got a lot of criticism about the Challenge Islamophobia Project from other Muslims uh, because in the Challenge Islamophobia Project, you know, I was really pushing up against the idea of, um, of, of using religion as a way to talk about Islamophobia. And a lot of Muslims were very unhappy about that. Like they believe that the sort of five pillars of Islam story, you know, which is so deeply problematic, that there is this like quick and easy five bullet point list of everything every Muslim does and loves about their religion. It's, uh, it's way too simple of a story. Um, you know, and I wanted to talk about racism and the lineage of white supremacy and racism in the United States in the Challenge Islamophobia Project. And I had a lot of Muslims um, who pushed back against that and thought that that was too radical. Um, and, uh, you know, that that was uh, very interesting in this project. Uh, I haven't had a lot of pushback yet. No. Maybe because I haven't fully shared it yet. And like a lot of what we're doing right now is still focused on the storytelling projects. Um, the feedback that I've gotten from the Muslim women who participated in the workshops has been uh, incredible. I mean, just a lot of um, love, a lot of community, a lot of feedback about how much more of uh, you know, these kinds of spaces and these kinds of activities that these women actually want to participate in. And it's good to see you, Nagar. Salam alaikum. So that was your question. Um, could you share the trauma? Uh, oh, okay. That's just a private. Um, mm -hmm. Other questions? Mm. Can so we just digest. Yes. Oh, Amy, good to see you. So much to digest. Are the pots continuing to communicate with you about their desire to be in the world? Absolutely. Uh, we just did. Um, and, and, and that's such a good point, because I think for me as an artist, what I need to do now is get the pots out in front of people. Uh, one of the reasons I'm so excited about coming to Duke tomorrow the more that these pots are actually in front of people, the more they communicate. So, um, so we had on 9-11 this past Saturday, we did a private 9-11 memorial 
uh, where uh, we invited a group of women to Sabrina and Jai's house, you know, because like I said, she's the psychotherapist and healer of this project. So we thought it would be most appropriate to do it in her yard. Uh, she has a beautiful yard covered with trees. The weather was really nice. We went to her yard. There were 16 of us. We created three circles of the pots, um, like three rings of the pots. All 99 of the pots were there. And then we each had to answer the question, what is worth remembering? And every woman in the group offered something. Some of us like threw something into the circle. So I said, for example, I was thinking about all of the unremembered. You know, again, this idea that every year we have this commemoration and there's a list of names that are uh, read every year for the people who died on 9-11. And of course, um, you know, the magnitude of their loss to their family members is, uh, you know, indescribable. And yet there are all of these other people who have been impacted and why are they not included in remembering what happened on 9-11? So at that event, I was thinking specifically about Abdul Rahman Al-Awlaki and his sister Nawar, uh, who uh, were, are US citizens. They were both um, assassinated in Yemen. Uh, Abdul Rahman Al-Awlaki, 16-year-old boy, no evidence whatsoever that he ever even said a cross word about the US government. The US government was angry at his father for purported crimes that he also was never brought to trial on. Uh, so Obama uh, ordered the extermination of their father, Anwar Awlaki. And then, uh, I don't know, just to kill off the whole family, uh, they killed Abdul Rahman on October 14th, 2011, in a drone attack. And then uh, Trump had his younger sister, eight years old, uh, killed on January 29th. 2017, a U.S. military soldier shot her in the neck until she bled to death. Um, and also on the 9-11 memorial, I was thinking about the Saudi-led airstrike on August 9th, 2018, when U.S. manufactured bombs made by Lockheed Martin uh, were dropped on a busload of Yemeni children, uh, killed 26 of them, wounded 19 more. Uh, so I was really just thinking about all of these children you know, who have been killed and that like, why don't we read their names every year? And that's what I put in the circle. And then other women like put their own stuff in the circle too, you know, their own stories, what they were thinking about. Um, and uh, so yes, to get back to your point, Amy, uh, yes. So when you, when I take the pots out, you know, it really just opens up this space where people want to put stories in them. You know, they want to add something. And so I am trying to stay really open-minded about, you know, at this point, not necessarily what I want these pots to do, because I think that I've mapped that out in this project, but now like, what do people want from the pots? And um, I think as an artist, of course, uh, um, so yes, as an artist, thinking about how, uh, yeah, thinking about what people need from the art, not just what I want to do creating the art. So that's an ongoing conversation. And I'm interested to see how that develops. Uh, let's see, Homera is going to chat soon, but she had to take her child to school. Um, I'm fascinated by the multifaceted nature of the project. There seems to be an emphasis on community and spaces for reflection which is by its nature not public. And there's a public dimension as well that is more caught up with issues of representation of Muslim women. It reminds me of the way so much activist work is not visible and public as well as not recognized as work often. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's, um, that's, such, a, that's such an interesting comment. And I really do struggle, you know, struggle with that in this is like, I wanna create a space for Muslim women to like do and say what they need to say without the pressures of other people telling them who they're supposed to be and how they're supposed to act. And yet the grassroots educator in me is always just thinking about like, how do we take this out into the world and share it in a way that can give people an experience that they haven't had before. I mean, we know this, we know that 
like the majority of Americans do not have a Muslim woman that, that they are, you know, intimate with, not as a best friend or a partner or someone that they can really hear these stories. And yet we also know like in anti-bias education that it is those very personal stories that really do affect people, you know, and help them to hear differently. Um, so I'm still struggling with that, uh, with that sort of public sharing piece and uh, always open to hearing uh, more about what people think I should do with them. Um, I'm happy to read the questions too for you, Allison. Okay, great. I think I'm at the, I think I'm at the end, uh, okay. but maybe I missed a couple. You can let me know if I missed. There was one up there stuff. and I will definitely oh, find please. it for you. Yeah. Oh yeah, please do. I'm sorry. I don't want to miss anyone's question. Um, have you had certain pots or names of God that have been louder, more significant to you over the past year and a half of COVID? Whew, gosh. That's just, that's so hard to answer. I, I think, you know, well, in the last storytelling workshop, we focused so much on uh, Rahman and, uh, you know, Rahman thinking about like the womb. And um, that's definitely been a theme of COVID uh, for me is like, how do I take care of myself uh, despite what's going on and sort of keep my work going and keep go doing what I believe God, you know, intends for me to do in the world when there's just all of this incredible disruption. And uh, yeah, I don't know, we could talk about the 99 names all day. They're all just so significant. So one of the questions was much more art focused and it was it looks like you're using the outdoor kiln. We saw that that in, in your picture. Mm. And there's a curiosity if you ever use a traditional kiln, or maybe you can talk a little yeah. bit about, because you let us see those pictures, oh, sure. um, the process, right? And how you fire your clay. And also the, the idea of every pot was different. And how did, are there stories attached to each, each pot, which you may have already kind of discussed, but that's, that's a curiosity that I have. Mm. There's not a story connected to each pot. The pots are a representation of the vicar that I was doing. This just deep remembrance and repetition. Uh, so that's really what the pots represent. Uh, the firing process. Okay. So I started out, I probably made 350 pots altogether. Uh, I started out with uh, multiple clay bodies. So first I had to figure out like what color the clay was going to do. Did I want a white clay, a brown clay, red clay? Experimented with those then experimented with a number of different firing methods. So I uh, tried some glaze in a cone six. Uh, I wood fired a bunch of them, which were also really, really beautiful. Um, the pit firing gave me the most dramatic fire marks. Uh, so I was, I was excited about that and it was very low tech. Um, and so I also liked that. Like some kilns, you know, you, you push them in there, you click on a button and then the electricity or the gas kicks in and it cooks them and, and then you're done. Whereas like pit fire and wood fire, it's just full body process, you know? Wood fires are 24 hours straight. You have to keep feeding the fire uh, for 24 hours. And so somebody always has to be there feeding the fire, which is its own like awesome, you know, art ritual. Um, so the pit fire, it's a very rustic uh, firing method where you literally just, you know, uh, you can, you can uh, dig a hole in the ground and make a pit that way. We did it with bricks, just built up a very simple kiln uh, with bricks. We filled it with uh, sawdust, copper carbonate, which is what gives the really bright red colors. You can make different colors uh, depending on what kind of chemicals you put in. Lots of salt, stir that up bury the pots, which I had bisked in an electric kiln, I think at like 06 before that, just to harden them. Uh, so then you, you bury them in this sawdust mess, lots of newspaper, lots of wood, set it on fire and keep feeding the fire for, I don't know, I usually feed it for like four hours. And then I cover the fire, let it start to burn out for another like two hours. And then I dig them out. Uh, and that's the process. And then, and then, uh, wipe them down and then wax them. Cause if you don't put wax on them and it's usually some weird, like floor wax, 
uh, that we use, but if you don't wax them, then the color will dull over time. So does that answer the art piece or um, so they don't collapse under the fire burning? So, so you, you make this bed at the bottom of the kiln with the um, sawdust and you bury them in there uh, like in one layer. So they're not dropping. There are other fires where we stack them on top and then some of them will drop and yeah, you'll lose some breaking, but that's just part of the process. But in this one, no, they don't. Uh, but the fire sometimes will crack them as you saw in the picture. Uh, but I also think those are really beautiful. It just keeps telling. Like, is there a history? Is there a history in Islam with the idea of art as ritual? You talked a little bit about, okay. you know, doing dicker with 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 the pieces. But mm -hmm. are there other examples of this in Islamic history? Oh, of course. I mean, I think of like, you know, miniature painting, of course, calligraphy. Um, uh, poetry. Uh, absolutely. You know, which, which is another important part of this thinking about this kind of like experimental worship space that I'm also really interested in creating with, with my artwork and where perhaps Homera is back, uh, from, uh, childcare duties. Um, and she could talk more about too, cause this is something the two of us are just deeply interested in is that in, in so many of the, uh, Muslim spaces, that we inhabit, there is, there are no practices of art, you know, art as a form of worship. And it is, you know, Khalik, the, the name of the creator, you know, we are the creator, uh, the creator lives within us. And so it is like, how do we channel that act of creation that we desperately need both to transform our own life into the things that make us deeply unhappy? Uh, and also how do we transform the world? into a place where, you know, my goal is to create a society that is radically inclusive and that, you know, protects the safety and security and dignity of all people with the same veracity with which we fight foreign wars and, you know, destroy people's communities and make people suffer. Um, so that art piece, I think, is really critical to, to these sort of new invigorated spaces that I'm looking for you know, is uh, that, that art is a form of Islamic worship. Homera, are you with us? Or not yet? Okay, well, she'll jump in when she comes back. There it goes. What other questions? Mm -hmm. Yeah, someone else just private messaged this idea about boredom. You know, with teaching, it's so true. It's uh, it's such a hard part for teachers, you know. Uh, educators are just expected to like, you know, just keep going and there's, low, there's so little space in uh, the careers of educators to really experiment, you know, with different ways of teaching and different ways of staying engaged. So um, always rooting on other educators to do that work however they can. Yes, of course, that's right. Like all kinds of uh, dancing in Vicar is also like a form of art. That's right. Yes, absolutely. Um, yeah, another question, how, what advice would you offer to en uh, enliven in the educational process to help wake up and inspire teachers more actively? Well, that's such a big question. I mean, that's just a structural problem. I think in educational institutions broadly where teachers are expected to just like teach nonstop uh, and don't have, you know, sabbaticals really to go out and experiment. Mm -hmm. Okay, other questions? I guess I would be interested uh, to know like where, where uh, 
where folks could see these pots, you know, sort of being out and being shared in different ways. You know, as I continue experimenting with that. And I think similarly from an interface lens, and you've touched on this, which I think is tremendously important that a lot of times Muslims feel as though in an interfaith space, they're the teachers, mm -hmm. but could this be used as a tool to inspire other people of other religious traditions and, and create a space like this for their own either healing or what have you? Have you ever, have you thought about that in any extent? Um, you know, using these in interfaith settings, I mean, I'm still pretty jaded <laughs> about, about being in these spaces. Um, you know, however, like perhaps this could set up a different dynamic. I mean, just when you, you know, I, I think there's, there's, there's just a lot of issues around like interfaith power dynamics that need to be, you know, radically rethought. Um, and, and I think even when some of us go into these spaces with really good intentions, uh, you know, that's where the power dynamics take over and stuff just doesn't, um, you know, unfold the way that we would hope that it would. So can people of other faiths use this project as inspiration to talk about their own experiences? Of course they can, right? I mean, this is just like a bait, you know, straight up storytelling project in that respect. In interfaith settings, you know, I mean, I guess part of part of it would be like, just listen to women's experiences first, you know, and start from there. Um, and of course, like building relationships with people before you just launch into asking all of these like incredibly intimate questions about people's relationships to God and relationships to their faith. You know, that's where interfaith can just be really weird. I mean, I don't meet somebody on the street for the first time and all of a sudden, like, these are some of the most intimate questions that you can ask me, you know, about my practice, about my relationship with God. Like, I need a little time to warm up and be able to trust you before I can share some of that stuff. And yet in interfaith, it's often like you just jump in you know, and start these conversations um, way too early, you know, and that just sets up this really uh, awkward dynamic that that isn't useful. And of course, in interfaith settings, you know, again, I would say for people like don't study about like Islamic practices from the start, right? Like I would really encourage that they study about racism and study about the representation of Muslims and what are they bringing to that space that they even want to know about, you know, different faith traditions um, and really kind of like digging through that before you launch into these other conversations about religion. Just looking at the chat quickly. Uh, yeah, I love the emphasis on beauty, both privately shared and community forming and public in this work. So much of the context of performing as Muslim in a public setting, yes, is about assuring a white liberal audience that we are not radical or dangerous at best or pacified and co-opted at worst. Yes, it's a lot to juggle. And it loses the subtle and important ability to talk about questions of beauty, art, spirituality, and the very stuff that makes Muslims maintain a tradition. Absolutely. That's right. Yeah, that's right. I mean, I think that... Um, you know, Omid, your comment there is so right. And, and like, that's some of the work of like rethinking any kind of interfaith space. I think it's almost one now. Yes. Um, so I just want to thank you. Thank you, Alison Kaizia, Professor McLarney, and all the attendees who joined us today. Next week, Wednesdays at the Center continues with another timely discussion titled Haiti and the Haitians, featuring former Haitian ambassador to the U.S., Jean Casimir, and Duke University's faculty, Deborah Jensen and Walter Mignolo. Thank you again, and we hope to see you next Wednesday. Have a great day. Thank you all. Take care.